this evening. We might get the discussion underway. My name is Lisa Sharland. I'm a senior analyst here at ASPE. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you here for our first Women in Defence and Security Network event for 2017. Uh, a couple of points I'll make with to start before we get underway with um, our distinguished panel this evening. Uh, first of all, for those of you who uh, follow social media or have an interest, this event will be on the record this evening. Um, so you may wish to follow um, ASPE underscore WDSN um, in terms of the Twitter handle, but please feel free to take part in the discussion. It's a little bit different to some of our other WDSN events that we've had in the past. Um, and the other thing which some of you may have seen that I'd like to briefly draw to your attention this evening is we've just put out a publication yesterday which draws together a series of posts that we were running on our blog, The Strategist, analysing different aspects of women, peace and security and what it means for Australia's defence and national security. Um, and I'm delighted to see that there are a couple of authors who contributed to that series that are in the audience tonight. So, um, again, thanks to them for taking part in that discussion. Before moving on and getting underway, it's also I'd like to acknowledge the sponsor for today's event, Lockheed Martin Australia, and their support that they've provided to WDSN um, since it um, commenced back in 2014. So, uh, to get underway, I'd like to introduce our panel tonight. And as I said to them earlier in the discussion, hopefully I haven't missed out critical parts of their biographies, because having such an esteemed panel up here means that they've got very extensive career experience that we'd like to highlight. First of all, Air Vice Marshal Warren McDonald uh, commenced as the Deputy Chief of the Air Force um, on promotion to Air Vice Marshal in July 2015. He's had an extensive career with the RAAF, <laughs> flying his first operational tour on the P3C Orion uh, at Number 11 Squadron. His early command posts included Commanding Officer of Number 11 Squadron, for which he was awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross. More recently, in October 2011, he deployed to the Middle East as the Australian Air Component Commander for Joint Task Force 633 in support of Operation Slipper. With over 5,000 hours on the P3, he has served four operational tours in the Middle East, each one in a different command position. Prior to taking up his appointment as the Deputy Chief of the Air Force, he served as Director General Capability Planning for the Air Force and Commander Air Mobility Group. Mobility Group. In July 2015, he was appointed a member of the Order of Australia. Moving on to our second panellist, uh, Major General Catherine Tui. Uh, she was appointed the Head of Land Capability in early 2017. She started out her career in the Army, serving in the Signals Corps. She also served as, a, as an instructor at the Royal Military College Duntroon, as the ADC to the Governor General, and deployed as a troop commander in the UN mission in Cambodia. Since 2001, Major General Tui has mainly filled acquisition-related appointments, she was awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross for her performance as Project Director for the ADF Satellite Communications Projects. In 2009, she accompanied her husband on posting to Brussels, where she worked part-time for Capability Development Group. She was subsequently posted to Force Development Group, then Director of the Capability Technolog Technology Management College and Director General Integrated Capability Development. And in 2016, Major General Tui took leave from the Army to take up a statutory appointment as the Deputy Electoral Commissioner in the Australian Electoral Commission for the 2016 election. Um, so that's our second panellist. I'm moving on to our third, and this is in no particular order, I should add. Uh, Rear Admiral Michael Noonan was appointed to the role of Deputy Chief of Navy in January 2016. He is a Principal Warfare Officer and Air Direction Specialist. His previous positions include Commodore Training, Director General Operations in Headquarters Joint Operations Command, and Director of Sailors Career Management. In December 2013, he assumed the position of Commander Border Protection Command. Rear Admiral Noonan also commanded HMAS Parramatta from her commissioning in 2003 to 2005. He was awarded commendations for distinguished service in his role in operations in the Middle East in 2003 and 2009, and was appointed a member of the Order of Australia in June 2012. And last but not least, by any means, we'd like to introduce Margaret Stabe, who holds the rank of Air Vice Marshal in the Air Force Active Reserve, having had a distinguished career over three decades in the Royal Australian Air Force. From January 2010, she held the position of Commander Joint Logistics. In 2000, her contribution and leadership in the field of ADF Aviation Inventory Management was recognised when she was awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross. A posting with the United States Air Force at the Pentagon furthered her experience of logistics transformation. Her service during this period was recognised with a United States Meritorious Service Medal. 
In January 2009, she was also appointed as a member in the Military Division of the Order of Australia. She was most recently, she was the Chief Executive Officer of Air Services Australia, and we're also delighted that Margaret serves on the board of ASPE at the moment. Um, so with that in mind, I would like to hand over to, to Margaret, who is going to lead our panel discussion this evening. We thought we'd have about 30 to 40 minutes with a guided discussion with the panel, and then we're going to open up the floor to a question and answer session with everyone in the audience. So. Over thank to you, you, Margaret. Thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, what a great opportunity to explore this topic. And thank you to the panel members for spending time with us, because it's a, a topic near and dear to, I think, everybody's heart. Um, I'm just going to start um, uh, the, the discussion by quoting from one of my favourite books on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, and it's by a lady called Laura Liswood. And it's titled The um, Loudest Duck. And uh, her, her book says, A Moving Beyond Diversity, while embracing differences to achieve success at work. And she says, Beware the Noah's Ark. Two women, two Asians, two people with disabilities, two Indigenous people, um, diversity accomplished, or so we once thought. At some point, corporate diversity came to mean the inclusion of at least two of every kind. Far too many managers and leaders figured that if you crammed a pair of each minority into a company or into a boardroom or into the military perhaps, she didn't say that, I just added that in, um, <laughs> you had accomplished the task of creating a diverse work environment. Well, nothing in fact could be far from reality. We've thought long and erroneously that diversity was achieved merely by recreating Noah's Ark. At least that's how the thinking has gone in the past. The push for diversity came to be about numbers, committees, employee networks, mission statements, um, strategic plans, tracking systems, uh, business er um, uh, cases and scorecards. Does that sound a bit familiar? Uh, it's true that in Noah's Ark those might be all necessary, so I'm not saying we shouldn't have those, but we've come to find that they are not sufficient. So on that note, um, the purpose of our discussion today is how do we achieve improvements in capability? So it's the outcome we're after, not just the numbers. Um, capability and operational effectiveness um, through diversity beyond just trying the Noah's Ark approach. So that's hopefully where the discussion that we're going to have this evening. Uh, we, we're going to ask, I'm going to ask a few questions because I get to because I'm the chair. And then we'll open it up to everybody and hopefully you all get um, to, to have your say. So my, my first question, and I'll, I'll start with you, Mike, and then we'll just go through um, each of the panel members get a chance to answer. But taking it to a more personal level, um, throughout your distinguished careers, and we've heard some of the highlights, um, when did it become apparent to you uh, that we really uh, need to improve our operational effectiveness and our capability <coughs> through um, a more diverse workforce? Uh, thanks, Margaret. Uh, for me, that's a pretty easy question. And um, I uh, grew up on the Gold Coast. Uh, I went to Cooper Park High School, which was a pretty large high school, a co-ed school. And, and I think I was in a, uh, probably the minority. I think we actually had a few more girls than boys at that school. And uh, on the 16th of January 1984, I got off a bus in Jarvis Bay uh, with 85 other guys. Um, and for the first time, I was in an all-male environment. Uh, I grew up in a, a family on the Gold Coast. I've got two sisters. And uh, all of a sudden, I found myself in this institution that was uh, dominated by men. Uh, and I thought, hmm, this is a bit different from what I've been used to. So I guess that struck me then, uh, day one in 1984. Uh, and then I guess the next 10 years of my, my Navy career, or the first 10 years of my Navy career, was spent in this male-dominated environment. Uh, and uh, it, it was very much a, a male-dominated environment. And you know, I then got to know the Navy a bit better and saw that our ships throughout history had, uh, had been all men. And uh, I thought, OK, this is the way it is. But clearly, it's not the way it needs to be, because it, it, it simply wasn't um, keeping track with where my beliefs were, and, and certainly where society would expect the Navy to be. Uh, so the next redefining point for me was in 1993, uh, when I was serving on board HMAS Canberra, one of our frigates. Uh, we'd been out for a week. We came in on a Friday afternoon, 
and there was four women standing on the wharf. And we thought, OK, what's happening now? And those women were the first women posted to that ship. Um, one of those women is now my wife. Uh, <laughs> so that's a pretty important defining moment in terms of <laughs> your personal career. And, uh, and I think you know, that, that was an interesting uh, time for the Navy, because we, we had gone on to the, to the Noah's Ark uh, metaphor that, uh, that Margaret had described in terms of we were mandated to have 10% women at sea overnight mm -hmm. in 1993. And uh, it, it was, uh, I guess, at best, a social experiment, um, and at worst, a, a failure of, of planning, policy, and, and implementation. Um, what I'm very proud to say, though, in, in a very short time since 1993, uh, we have learned a lot, to the point that in 1996, when I then next went back to sea in one of our Anzac-class frigates, um, the women weren't standing on the wharf. Uh, they were actually part of the ship's company from commissioning. And when I commissioned HMOs Parramatta as the CO in, uh, in 2003, uh, I had 35 women on board that ship as part of my ship's company from day one. And, and they were an integral part uh, of the capability, not aliens that were descended upon into this male-dominated world at a, at a given point in time. Um, so I guess the next personal point of that journey for me was in 2000, uh, when, my, when I was here in Canberra, uh, working in Navy headquarters, and, uh, and my wife was at sea commanding HMAS Labuan in operations in East Timor, and I was at home looking after the dog, uh, trying, help, trying to pay the bills and, and manage, <coughs> manage my life. And I thought, well, that, that's, you know, that's what I've grown up, that's what I would expect. And, uh, and I think you know, moving forward from there, as, and I'm sure that we'll cover it in the course of this, 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 uh, this evening, is that uh, every part of the Navy in which I'm now part of is, is striving towards a greater balance of inclusion and diversity of not just women but of, of all the two plus twos um, to make it a more capable defence force. So, you know, for me it's been a journey my entire career about realising um, a better capability through inclusion. Thank you. Yes? Mm. Okay, I should say up front, and I mentioned this to a few people before I came in, uh, I'm obviously not the Deputy Chief of Army. Uh, he would have been here today, but he's at a promotion board. Uh, and as a classmate of mine pointed out, I was the last woman standing, apparently. Um, uh, I am really pleased to be here. Uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, in Army, I'd say at the moment, most women don't think about being women. Uh, most women in army, and maybe I'm generalising, but my experience is uh, women in army at the moment feel like they're part of the team. So in thinking about the questions for today, I really had to dig deep. Uh, in terms of when I first realised the importance of women being in the military, I'd have to say I realised that before I joined, and that's one of the reasons I joined. Uh, I happened to be in the second class at ADVA uh, back in 1987. It was pretty wild and woolly back in 1987. If you know Tuckman's stages of group dynamics, forming, storming, norming and performing, uh, for the three years I was there, uh, we were pretty much permanently in the storming phase. Uh, I joined with... Uh, nearly 30 army girls and at the end of three years I graduated with three army girls. There were four army women that graduated in 1990. Um, for me, uh, they are the, they exemplify the reason why we need women in the military. Uh, Kate Campbell, and there's a few people in the audience that know these women, Kate Campbell graduated with an honours degree in chemistry she was one of the first women to become an ATO and for anyone in the audience uh, that's not military, if you think of the movie The Hurt Locker, uh, they are ATOs just on operations. So Kate graduated with an honours degree in chemistry, she became an ATO and she's got the best first day on the job story <laughs> in that she was required to disable a grenade that was sitting in the front seat of a car parked in the middle of Brisbane. 
Kate served for 28 years uh, and then she retired. Uh, she now works as a part-time reservist. Kat Sowry, we used to call Kat Sowry the combat wombat. Uh, Kath graduated with an honours degree in English, uh, a logistics officer. Uh, she did a range of logistics postings, uh, went to Bougainville. She then moved into the purse policy area. Uh, she had four children and she supported her husband who recently, recently retired as a brigadier. And for me, Kath is living proof that sometimes as a woman, you can have it all, you just can't have it all at once. And uh, Kath's career is back on the, the Clyde path. And Bill, anyone here know Bill Sowry? He's at home uh, keeping house, it's fantastic. Uh, my third classmate, Karen McFadgen, uh, she's also an engineer. Uh, Karen uh, took the extended engineering program. Uh, she was at ADFA for five years. She had a career as a junior officer in electronic warfare, super capable individual. She left the military after 14 years and she moved into the IT world. Uh, Karen recently retired, as in retired full stop, uh, as the vice president for Cisco Systems. Uh, back in 2010, uh, Australia put two women on an international women's uh, forum. Uh, I think Madeline Albright was on the forum that year, the Queen of Jordan was on the forum that year, and Karen was the Australian rep. And if you ever Google her, she's all over the place, and she actually <coughs> refers to the secret of her success being her military training. Uh, so I graduated with three amazing women. Uh, I actually think it's a shame that the other 20 women there's about that we started with didn't get through. Um, I think that's a missed opportunity for Army. Uh, I'm also a great believer that women can have a great career and uh, the four of us have had very different careers but equally fantastic. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Kath. And Lauren, yourself. Uh, Michael and I were recently at the CDF Leadership Forum up in Townsville. And <coughs> a question from one of the syndicates was along the Noah's Ark line. But the question basically was, why do we need special measures for women? Uh, my response to that was, if you're comfortable to go back and sit at the dinner table and look at your daughter in the eye and your wife in the eye and say they shouldn't have the opportunity that you have, then you've got no place in Air Force. There are times where you do need to make those Noah Ark special measures, otherwise nothing will happen if you leave it up to the male elements uh, that have been dominating particular services or particular organisations. So my belief, you do need to take those measures, and we still do. I'm comforted by the fact that less and less those types of questions come to the fore, and people truly understand what it's like to have that diversity and have that intellect and that what I call rounding out uh, that women bring to an organisation. I married a suffragette, my wife, and I was brought up by a woman who should have been a suffragette as well. So like Michael, when I joined in 1979, it was very much the same experience. As an apprentice, fully male dominated, I thought we're in trouble because there's no woman here trying to organise us all. Okay, <laughs> But what I also saw as I went through, uh, when I finished my trade training, I was a motor mechanic when I first started in Air Force, was the first woman to be a motor mechanic and the first indigenous female to be a motor mechanic. What I saw uh, through that was how difficult it was for them. Everybody was watching. Everybody had a comment to make and just how hard that must have been for them to just get on with their job. I saw the way they approached it, a very male way. A male would take a, a, a you know, wheel off a vehicle, would be to just pull it off. They would use the equipment that was appropriately made to do it. <laughs> and in fact, they did it just as quickly and more effectively than the males who then had to go down to, to medical because they'd had a back strain. <laughs> but I saw in them, it must have been very difficult to be 
uh, women in that organisation, very male dominated. But what I also saw were some males taking some leadership roles, the locker room type uh, fraternity. A lot of the posters were removed because we had some good leadership in there, a good sergeant who, whilst the women uh, weren't entering those locker rooms, he was unhappy that that type of behaviour existed. The junior officer in charge, a pilot officer, also took that same step and started talking to the entire workforce back in 1981 about it's time to clean up your act, it's time to be more accepting. I can't remember the names or the name of that officer, but it was it was a hard thing to do to stand up in front of a fairly hardened organisation and start saying those things. Then I went on to pilot's course and I was in 1979, so it was a year after the first two women graduated from pilot's course, I was on pilot's course with Linda Corhall, uh, who was an ex-air traffic controller, who I rate incredibly. She just got on with business, whilst a lot of untrained SEALs, uh, who were myself as junior pilots and junior officers, faffed around and tried to work out what we're doing as aviators. Over that pilot's course, we had to be amalgamated. And through that amalgamation of one pilot's course and another, Linda stood out for leadership because there was tribalism in a very male-dominated pilot's course one, pilot's course two, had to put them together. So there was a lot of us sitting on one side of the, the room, the other course sitting on the other side. Linda, in the end, had enough. She stood up and said, grow up, get over yourselves, and start working as a team, because I've had enough. And I always looked at her, how difficult that must have been. Uh, she made it look easy, though, in front of us all, but then it got us uh, together as a team, and actually we graduated as a team on that pilot's course. So they're the kind of things I see, and these days, when I move forward, I don't see necessarily the, what I don't see what I've seen in the past. It, it is a changed organisation. There is a lot to be done yet. And I see it, uh, the whole capability piece that women bring and men bring in an organisation has a far better outcome than where we were in 1979. It is a completely different outfit. And I thank all those who have gone before it, the women, who have importantly and uh, taken on that challenge to be the first at something. I know, you know, for Kath, I talk. Uh, specifically for Kath, I talked for Linda Cobalt, I talked for Colleen, who was the first female Indigenous uh, mechanic. You have a lot to thank them for, for those women who are coming in afterwards, and the, and the men have a lot to thank them for as well. Thank you. I'm going to um, now ask about some of the um, specific, um, specific sorry, um, measures that each of the services are employing. Um, my, my notes here say that, you know, we, we have set targets, um, um, out to 2023. Um, Navy, Mike, I think it's 25%, um, that's what you're targeting. Army, it's 15%. And uh, Air Force, it's 25%. Um, we won't have a debate unless in the, in the open session you want to talk about that. But, but it's more about there are some deliberate measures to um, move forward in, in terms of the numbers. Perhaps you could share with us um, what they are and um, your assessment of how they're going so far. Uh, thanks, Margaret. Uh, and numbers count, um, but they also uh, don't matter in terms of what you're trying to achieve ultimately. Uh, so the number of 25% in Navy is completely irrelevant to me. And the message that I have uh, distributed through Navy is that the number's not 25% because somebody has randomly generated that number uh, and it does not provide me with any context in which to operate in in terms of why 25%. So um, I've got my <coughs> Director General of Navy Personnel, Michelle Miller, uh, there, and we've got the Chief of Navy Strategic Women's Advisor here, and I've told them that the number's 35%. Why 35%? Um, arguably, it is just as random as 25%. But when I sit in an environment which is currently sitting at 19.8%, a stretch target to 25% by 2023 is meaningless. It will mean that we will continue to do what we've always been doing to close the gap on that other 6%. And at the end of the day, what 6%? In the Navy, it equates to about 20 women. So I'm saying 
what I need to do is something different. And the first thing to make the organisation aware that I'm serious about this is saying, I'm going to sack my Director General of Navy personnel if I don't get to 35%. And I don't care. And I don't care is this if she. News? <laughs> I don't care if she's a if she's a woman or if she's a man, or if he's a man. Uh, the 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 reality is we've got to do things differently, and, and that's my big message there. So what are we doing differently? Uh, we are actually taking a capability view of this and saying, okay, if we are going to get to 35 percent, we've actually got to design our ships differently. We've actually got to design our facilities around the Navy completely differently, which is a great opportunity for us because the Navy that I described that I joined in 1984 was a, a Navy that had been designed in the 60s. And it, and it was, uh, it did have physical barriers about the way the ships were designed. Uh, here we are in 2017 and the Navy's about to embark upon a shipbuilding program that will see us replace our Navy over the next 20 years each and every one of those ships will be able to take not 25%, not 35%, but 100% women, if that's where we're able to get to during the lives of those ships. So looking at this from what it is we do and how we do it is really important. And we are designing our future Navy around this thing called inclusion and diversity. Uh, specifically, uh, when we look at what we're doing right here and now today, the current recruit course at HMAS Cerberus in Victoria has 65% women on that recruit course um, because we're actively going after talent. Not actively going after women, we're actively going after talent. So when we get to talking about the culture of our services and particularly the Navy, um, that piece about that male dominated culture that I encountered in 1984 is actually not about trying to get a balanced culture, it's about getting a culture in Navy that's about innovation, talent, smart people that can drive ships, go to war and do the things that the government requires us to do of a Navy in a culture that's about agility and it's about smartness, it's about flexibility. And if that's going to be women, men, um, Indigenous people, people with disabilities, they're the people I want in my workforce. So that's the way that we are thinking specifically. So when I look at uh, how do I achieve that on a, on a, on a coal-faced level, We've actually got a uh, diversity and inclusion council in Navy, which I chair, uh, which talks about how do we bring these capabilities into our workplace? What specific strategies do we need to have, not just in recruiting, recruiting's the easy bit, it's about retention. Because I've got to grow a workforce over the next 30 years when you're a all-male dominated environment asking the female deputy chief of Navy what you're gonna do to get more women back, more, more men back to sea. Yeah, that's, that's the challenge I've set myself. Um, and you know, we can talk specifically if, during questions if you want to know exactly where we're going with some of these initiatives. Um, but that's the flavour of, of what we're looking at. Looking at not just, reten not just recruiting but retention and specifically how do we make our workforce more attractive for women and men to come and go to balance all of those demands around being in a family unit and having ongoing careers. So one of the things that we talk about in terms of um, the new way of looking at career models is we've got this thing called a total workforce model, which is about allowing people to come and go, do reserve service, take up service in another industry, potentially come back. And, and the way that the Chief of Navy describes that is that I want to provide every person in the Navy, if they so choose, the opportunity to have a 20-year career over 40 years. And that's providing flexibility to fit in all of those other things that we all want to do in our lives. That's great, thank you. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of synergies, I think, between all three services in terms of the total workforce, in, in terms of uh, gender management councils and the like. Um, you've probably heard in the, the news that last year, Army opened up the last of its combat positions mm -hmm. to women. Uh, so anyone can do any role in Army at the moment, irrespective of gender, as long as they're a volunteer, as long as they've done their employment training, and as long as they've passed their physical tests. Uh, around the same time as we opened up all the combat positions, uh, we reviewed those physical tests, 
because we wanted to make sure that those physical tests weren't actually biased from a gender perspective. Uh, so we did a lot of work to ensure that those tests are absolutely trade and employment specific. Uh, just in the newspapers this morning, there were a few articles about the Army's uh, politically correct degradation of uh, the capability that we're delivering. If I can say amongst friends, uh, that's nonsense. Uh, not surprisingly, there hasn't been a tidal wave of women uh, rushing to do combat roles. Uh, I think at the moment we've got 17 women in the Infantry Corps. I can tell you they are amazing women, they are super fit and they're actually improving the performance. There is nothing about a degradation. Uh, I'd also say that Army is wanting to get more women through its doors. When I joined 30 years ago, 10% of Army were women and 30 years later, we've got to 12.7%. And it's just not good enough. Uh, I actually have an 18-year-old daughter and she's a world beater and Army would be very lucky to get her. Um, this is all about talent. We are trying to get more women through the doors to come to, to Army. One of the challenges is, I understand in Australia at the moment, the average age women stop playing sport is 14. Mm. As a result, some of our initiatives are about bridging that physical gap. Uh, for instance, before Kapuka, there's a preconditioning course that women can do. We bring them in for seven weeks. Uh, they do physical training, they do adventure training, and they do resilience training. Uh, I tell you, when I was talking to our purse guys this morning, I said, can you actually make it a reconditioning course as well? <laughs> <laughs> How fantastic to spend seven weeks improving yourself. Um, uh, we've, ha we've run six courses now, 25 women on each course. Uh, it's really about getting women physically competent to go through the training. For those women that want to go to the arms cause, and the number of women going to arms cause will, in will increase in the future, uh, they can avail themselves of a personal trainer for the space of three months uh, before they enlist. We are also conscious of the need to retain women, uh, and I think it is difficult for women. Uh, we do still uh, bear the, the greatest responsibility when it comes to looking after children. Uh, we have part-time work. Uh, we have the ability to recruit people to location. So single mothers, for instance, they might want to join the military, but they can't afford to then be posted away from extended family. So we are flexible in terms of recruiting them so that they can go back to their home base. I would say Army is doing everything we can, uh, and we're doing it because of the talent. We don't just want to get talented people from 50% of the population, we want to access people from 100% of the population. Thanks, Kath. And Lauren? Yeah, I think for all the speakers here tonight, it, it's cold comfort in the statistics. So Air Force is looking for 25% by 2023. We're at 20%, but like Michael and Kath, it's cold comfort. Because you look inside those figures, whilst we, can, whilst we can get women into Air Force, it's retaining them. So I'll give you a statistic. Uh, 20 years and below, the ratio of male to female is 1.6. You go to my age bracket, 50 to 54, eight times more men than women. You start going from 20 to uh, 25, it goes three times more men. 25 to 30, five times more men. And unfortunately, you see it all drop off. Why is it we can't keep women to come through and, and start pushing down on that dominance of eight times the amount. That, that's where we have to do more work. It, it is difficult. Uh, and I would have to say that the services collectively do offer as much as they humanly can uh, to enable for women to stay inside the, inside the forces. Whilst um, we have 20%, what's in some of those figures? So if you look inside non-traditional roles, 6.4 per cent in Air Force. You pull down into technical trades at 4.4 per cent. And not all technical trades have representation of women in it. 
You go to the more traditional, and there's a dominance of women over men. So in logistics, administration, legal, medical, uh, you're well up above the 55, sometimes 60%, sometimes a dominance of 73%. But it's where we want you know, more diversity in, we would like more fighter pilots. It's not fast jet pilots, we've got fast jets, we've got women who occupy the seats of C-17s, C-130s, they're fast. It's actually fast jet, uh, combat pilot, which, which is a difference. It's about killing people, that's what it's about. It's, it's one on one or one on many, but it's about killing people. Trying to, men seem to be attracted to that, trying to attract women to it is what we're after. We have four currently. None yet who have gone through to their operational conversion, but we have four in the pipeline. 1.7% of fighter pilots. We, like Kath, like Mike, would like a greater representation because actually by putting focused effort in that, in looking at, okay, how, how do we make it more attractive to women to, to want to be a combat pilot in Air Force? We've changed the way we structure that course. And there's been a lot of male feedback to say, this is of great benefit. Uh, it's actually helping me get through. And we're finding that pass rates are increasing. So that's why it's important for us to sometimes set those goals, take some action that some uh, ignorant people, uh, particularly as Cass said in the press today, take umbrage to, ignore them completely and just get on with the task of trying to make a change. So that's some of the statistics that sit around that 20%. It's that retention piece which is the key for us at the moment. How do we actually make that happen? But I think you have to take some comfort along the way. So I was flying back from Townsville on one of our VIP aircraft and we have crew attendants, of which their representation is about 73%. There was a very young uh, crew attendant talking to a crew attendant who had come back in uh, after leaving the Royal Australian Air Force. And the young crew attendant was completely oblivious to the issues that the more senior woman had had whilst she was inside Air Force. He said, what do you mean? Uh, flexible work arrangements, they've been around forever, haven't they? Um, <laughs> Why, why did you have to leave? It was, and I wished I could have taped it because it would have been very instructive for where we'd been to where we are today. And uh, the more senior woman was very thankful that we'd made those changes so she could contribute back. And for us in Air Force, we're very thankful that, uh, that she made that step. Thank you. We, um, just looking at the uh, 2016 um, Defence White Paper, um, and it says gender equality and increasing female participation in the defence workforce and in senior leadership roles is fundamental to achieving defence capability now and into the future. So I might just turn now to how do you see what needs to be done for the future? And I was actually very heartened, Mike, that the example you just gave is, a, is an excellent example. You've got an opportunity, perhaps once in a lifetime, to redesign the ships. So, so you're removing actually a physical, structural um, issue. But what other things do we have to do to make sure that we've got an eye onto the future? Yep. Uh, well, follow on that. Uh, thanks, thanks, Margaret. I think uh, certainly if you look at a, a career in the military, uh, let's face it, we, we all pretty well understand that it's a hierarchical structure. Um, and it's hierarchical in terms that you need to move through certain gates and do certain things to be able to get to become the Chief of Navy. <laughs> Um, some of those things are you've got to have command at a junior level. You've got to either be in command of a, of a squadron or of aeroplanes or, or uh, of a ship or, or, or a battalion of tanks, whatever, whatever that, that piece is that allows you to, 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 to demonstrate your operational expertise to move through. And if your force structure doesn't allow people to move through those gates, you've got to do one of two things, either change your policies... Uh, or change your ability to get people through those through those uh, professional development gates. So, you know, the example I gave about the ships will allow allow us to have more women uh, go through uh, time at sea. Currently, uh, of our statistics, again, I, I'm sorry, but uh, but the importance of it is that uh, at sea at the moment um, we have 16.5% women, which is actually pretty good. In, when you look at it in terms of what it means of the workforce, 
of the people who are trained and, and qualified in the Navy right now, um, out, of the, out of the female workforce, uh, we've got 27% um, of them are at sea. Out of all the men who are trained in our workforce, uh, only 33% of them at sea. So we're actually closing that gap in terms of representation um, through that, through that uh, continuum. So we're, we're always uh, looking at, at what are the barriers. And if you concentrate on the barriers of how do we get people through um, uh, the, the jobs that they need to do to have the skills and experience to, to perform in the senior leadership positions, that's where we'll, we will make our differences. Um, so that's what we're really concentrating on at the moment. And a lot of work around what is not just best practice, because is best practice good enough? Best practice has got us to where we are now. It's, it's actually having an understanding um, what is possible, what is the art of possible, and then going after those policies and changing them. And hence, all of that talk that we've had between the three of us about the, uh, the flexible employment, uh, the, the work offers really does come to the heart at providing opportunities for people to get through those professional um, uh, gates, I guess, in terms of allowing them to have the opportunity to have command various ranks, have those leadership experience at, at, at various ranks. And ultimately, we are in the business of killing people, um, giving them the opportunity to get operations experience so that, uh, heaven forbid, that we are in the situation where we have to kill people, they can do it. And they can do it efficiently, and they can do it in a way that allows us to, to do the very rare thing that the Australian Defence Force does, and that is use lethal force in a legal way to achieve an outcome. And you know, that, that is what we're about, and we need to be able to have an understanding at all ranks, at all genders, in every element of, of those that are employed in the ADF, that ultimately that's what we're about. And we, we really hope that we never have to do it, but if we do, we've got to be prepared for it. So it's education, it's policies, it's physically changing our capabilities, but it's about the culture. And it's about setting a mindset around understanding what we do and how we do it, and looking at what barriers exist and removing them. Thanks. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the only thing I would add is, uh, uh, you've all heard of the expression, you can't be it unless you see it. Mm. Uh, I've never actually worked for a woman and uh, I think that's a great tragedy because you never know I could uh, finish my working life and never had the pleasure of working for another woman. Uh, I think role modelling is really important. Uh, I One of the reasons I got out of defence was to go off and have a new adventure, something, something different, something challenging. Uh, I went to an organisation, the Australian Electoral Commission, 67% of the workforce is female. But there were no other women in the senior leadership group. Uh, it, was, um, it was a bit tragic. Uh, it is fantastic to be back in defence because I think defence understands that women absolutely need to get there on merit. But we've got to make sure that we have the structures around them, the policies, the education, the culture, so that we are putting women in a position where we can pull younger women through. I, I do think it's important. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, I, just on that before I answer the, your, your real question, it is important for women to advocate for other women. Mm, yes. And I'll be, you know, I'll be quite open. I'm open in other forums. Some women don't do that. Mm. And, it, and it really is not in the best interests of the system. Uh, and I've seen women, some women actively uh, trying to uh, pull the ladder up behind them. So that that is incredibly unfortunate. Uh, so I, I would ask everyone in the audience here, if the women here, to actively mentor other women to be successful. I know Kath does. Uh, and it's important for every woman to do that. Um, back on the capability side, I, I look through Air Force and I do actively look through it. I don't see impediments in the capabilities we have that a woman, a woman cannot do. I, I really do. You know, if you want to look at platform types or aircraft, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, what you sit inside that aircraft. It doesn't matter the gender. It's capable of being operated. I don't see an impediment. And 
the systems and the way engineering are go is going these days, it's less and less. That's what I truly, truly believe when I look at it. Because a uh, woman F-35 uh, pilot, the aircraft doesn't care. It couldn't care less <laughs> what's inside it. It will only do what it's told to do. And that goes for all the platforms Air Force has. Mm. So I don't see an impediment. Um, if there is one out there, I'm very keen to find out what it is because the Executive Warrant Officer and I will work on removing that. Um, we just had a command selection board inside Air Force. That's where we look at all the commands through. Um, and it was very interesting to watch a lot of women bat the competition out of the park for those selections. <coughs> very strong uh, representation. Uh, it ended up being about 20% of representation for commands that women will hold. Uh, and it was very good to see the level of competition they were placing inside the, the field there. Um, in the special measures area, um, we do look at that at the boards. We At the end of it, we see what, what the outcome is. Um, but also, we've got to be careful we don't set women up as well uh, when, you, when you make a corrective move back to the Noah's Ark piece. That, that's important because uh, for other women and also for the women themselves to, uh, to make sure that they go forward and are successful in doing so, particularly when you're the first in a particular area. That's mm. important. So. Thank you. Look, I, I had a couple more questions, but I feel that that's not fair to you all. <laughs> so why don't we at this juncture open up um, to the floor and, and we'll take questions. Uh, I understand we've got some microphones around the room. So how about you, if you want to ask a question, pop your hand up and just say who you are and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. First one. <laughs> Hi, my name's Happy. Thank you so much for the talk. That was very informative. Um, I have a question. Uh, you were speaking about disability earlier and the armed forces have very stringent requirements on physical health. Many, you know, many disabilities and many medical conditions are actually incredibly manageable, very easy to manage. Yet there are a bunch of people that are excluded from recruitment because of those requirements. Could you comment on that or is like, are the armed forces considering changing that, particularly in the case of manageable, like, you know, medical conditions and disabilities, or not really? Um, I'll have a crack at it to start with. Kiv and I clearly opened the door on that. Um, short answer is yes, and there has been a significant amount of work done in the last two years that reviews the medical categorisations and standards uh, of our people. And we've actually looked at some of those, uh, those things. Asthma, for example. Uh, when I joined the Navy, if you had asthma, forget it. You weren't getting in. Uh, and now we're able to see that um, we can, in fact, let people in and uh, where those issues can be managed uh, through medication. Uh, we've now got a, a much greater uh, level of tolerance for some of those things that traditionally didn't allow people into, certainly, the Navy. Um, the Navy is pretty unique to the other two services in that if you join the Navy, you are expected to go to sea. In fact, you are required to go to sea. If you join the Air Force, you're not expected to fly a plane. Um, so one of the things that we have to look at is if we go to sea, you will expect to be on a ship for two to three years. And during that period, as we've currently got, we've got a ship in the Middle East at the moment, that ship will be there for nine months and it is on operations for nine months. And so uh, that ship has to have people on it that can operate away from home, um, pot potentially away from direct medical care. Um, they'll still have their 4G <laughs> networks, which is really important these days. <laughs> Dr uh, Google. Yeah. Um, so, so the standards that we, we need to apply in that physical space um, across the, the, the entry requirement is, is very specific for Navy. What we can look at, though, however, is as the, as the nature of our workforce evolves around different capabilities that we're reducing, we will always be able to um, look at individual skill sets and, and look at people who can bring um, talent and that diversity that I was talking about into uh, the Navy, and they may be able to be very uh, um, uh, discreetly employed in specialist niche areas where there isn't a seagoing requirement. But on, on the face of things, 
as, as the workforce employer, I, I employ you to come to sea and go to sea in ships. Now, as technology changes, and I'm not foreseeing anything in the future white paper, one day we may have ships that don't have people on them. And the people who are operating those ships may be sitting back here in Canberra behind a terminal and driving them very much as the way that Warren will talk about remotely piloted aircraft. And um, there will be always a requirement for uh, us to have people that can go and do things at sea in boats, but the changing nature of the capabilities and the nature of warfare will change the ability for us to open up that aperture for a wider look at people. So the comment that I made about disability uh, is very much through the context of the uh, Inclusion and Diversity Council, which I chair. And I've said, when we came, and, and even that in itself is, is a part of evolution. Um, we've said, this is not about um, women. It's not about LGBTI. It's not about Indigenous. It's about inclusion. And why not look at how we might, into the future, be able to widen that inclusion of people with disabilities? Uh, one of the things that I, I am challenged with on a daily basis, as I know my other two colleagues is, is the issue of mental health. Uh, mental health uh, within current serving people and mental health of people who have left the services. And I don't want to take us down a, a, a rabbit warren there, but it's something that, that, is, that is constantly uh, under examination uh, in terms of society. And the current, the current restrictions uh, would be that if, if you've got a history of mental health, we won't recruit you into the Defence Force. Um, why? We're not saying that you haven't got it under control or, or that you are in any way a bad person, but you represent a high-risk category in terms of being able to deploy on operations. So we then look at individuals on a case-by-case -case basis to see whether or not there is some employment offer that we can have that suits them and us. In some cases, the answer to that is, is becoming yes but we've still got a long way to go before we can say that anybody can join. Do you want to add anything? I think Michael's covered it yeah. pretty okay. well. So, any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> I'm not sure you can speak loud enough, but I need a microphone. I'm Colonel uh, Rose King from the New Zealand Defence Force. Mm. Um, I've really appreciated um, hearing your insights because obviously we're going through a very similar journey. Um, there's just one comment I'd like to make in regard to percentages. So we looked at a percentage market, uh, sorry, target of 30 because I believe it's been proven that's a tipping point of when you know it on the field like a minority. Um, although interesting, I believe we're now trying to extend that figure as well. Um, but I had a question... That's because we were at 25 and you then thought you needed to get to 30. Right. We're now at 35, so you want to get ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we love, we love <laughs> our sisters and brothers from New Zealand. Yeah. Um, but DF, I had a question for you, sir, in regard to you, you said that you believe that you've got no um, impediments in regard to capability platforms. I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts in regard to your culture and are there any um, impediments on that side? Yeah, look, most definitely. Uh, so I'll give an example. This is sort of a capability and culture piece, so uh, probably come under fire from some other category. But uh, Loadmasters very male dominated and has been. So for cargo, compartment, uh, supervision and uh, onload and offload of aircraft, very male dominated, as has flight engineers been, very male dominated. Uh, we have introduced women into that area. Now there's a bit of a cultural element to overcome. However, what you found was that some of the men stood up and started to take a bit of a leadership role in that and turned some of the those who would have been classed as heroes into zeros. Um, what we tried to do was pair women up when they went into it so they didn't feel isolated. And that's, that's our approach we're doing when we're starting to put women into non-traditional roles is to pair them or put them into groups and I think that's, that's a very good move. Um, and it is interesting to hear some of the comments out of the Loadmaster fraternity now where uh, some of the women are asking questions of why are these cargo nets so heavy? And the guys are saying, yeah, they are a bit heavy. Is, is there anything? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they're now advocating for changes in equipment, uh, which makes a hell of a lot of sense. So there's a company called Fibertech who made 
almost carbon fibre to get one third the weight. Mm. So we're going to make cargo nets that one third the weight um, because it all makes a lot of sense. So yes, there are cultural barriers. Absolutely, I'd be uh, lying standing. I was sitting up here saying that there are not. There is a lot of work we need to do inside some work groups inside Air Force uh, in making them more culturally acceptable and accepting. Uh, but we are very active in that space, and rightly so. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, ladies and gents, um, thank you so much for your um, insights so far. My name's Zoe Thorne. I recognise the two in the middle very closely, but it's been a while since I've seen either of you. My question's to do with stigma. Um, in 2000, I was at RMC, and Colonel John Black was the CEO of RMC at the time. He was really keen to um, get a few of us women in that class into artillery. Uh, all of us chose no, because we didn't want to see ourselves bashing our head against a brick wall for the next 10 years. I then, a couple of years ago, much later on in my career, found myself at DG First Army, and facing the same challenges, working with the Chief and DFR trying to increase the, increase the number of recruitment for women. I found probably the biggest barrier at that time was actually the stigma associated with infantry corps, artillery, and the army in general, particularly obviously mine was, mine was obviously related to army, but I'm sure the other services have had similar concerns. How do you get away from that stigma, or is it just a time thing that you have to try and ride out and change culture of not only the services, but change culture within the community and that attitude? Mm. Who would like to take that one on? Short yeah. turn, Kath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, all good. Um, so if I could uh, tackle this in a number of ways. Uh, Army's values, courage, teamwork, initiative, respect was added a couple of years ago because we identified that that is something that we need to emphasise. Um, teamwork, respect uh, actually breed inclusivity. Uh, I think culture takes a long time to form. I think uh, we're seeing at the moment, uh, right from the chief down, uh, he is very much driving us along the lines of inclusivity, uh, calm, considered, very much a team of teams. I do think, and this is a personal opinion, uh, that women need to do a bit to support it as well. We have got women in army doing amazing things and many of them are doing what I've done for 30 years, uh, keeping their head below the parapet. I actually think army women need to stand up uh, and we need to start telling the positive stories because there are many positive stories uh, and perhaps take control of the narrative because outside of the army perhaps people think about harassment and discrimination and some terrible things have happened in our history and unfortunately there are still terrible things happening but I think overall the narrative should be positive and I think we need to get over ourselves just quietly and we need to take control. Mm. Yeah. I might just add, add to Cass' comments there that piece about culture Zoe I think really is stigma culture. Um, and that's the way that we're tackling it. Certainly from a Navy perspective, uh, we've gone very much from being a, a rules-based organisation to a values-based organisation. And uh, um, many of you in the audience would have heard of uh, New Generation Navy, NGN, which, which was brought in as a, a cultural change program in Navy about six years ago. Uh, and it was the latest fad. It was the latest change thing. Well, actually, it's not. It, it is here forever. Uh, because we've actually realised that change and cultural change is a continuous thing. And uh, I've got uh, Wendy Gould, who is the project director or director of uh, uh, our NGN program, um, with us. And you know, if you want to talk culture and change, uh, uh, Wendy will sort of talk to you about, about the next six hours. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's really important that we say... You know, those things that were roadblockers in the past is unless you've got a, a, a culture that's looking at change and innovation and that becomes part of your, the DNA of your company uh, or of your Air Force or of your Army or of your Navy, um, you, you will have those stigmas that will 
um, whether they be traditional ones or they be new ones that pop up, um, you, you need to have a way to combat that. So I think certainly in Navy we've, we've recognised that NGN is not the latest fad. Um, it will be passed from generation to generation and it will be an enduring program around culture and behaviour and values. And it is now the thing that we use as the big stick. We don't use the rules based and we don't use the dis discipline system as the big stick. We actually use the culture and the values and the behaviours as the big stick. Because if you don't conform to what is our culture and what is what we expect of people in a values based organisation, the Chief of Navy will say, you don't fit my culture. Goodbye. Warren, did you want to add anything there? Uh, I think for culture, so today, uh, Air Force became a uh, white ribbon accredited. So all three services are now, and that is the first time for any uh, defence organisation in the world to, to be accredited uh, completely with white ribbon. That's just one part of the march that all three services have been on to change culture. It takes time, sadly, uh, but it is happening and it, and it will continue to do so. Mm, thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Tessa and I'm a civilian with Defence. Um, your comments, Kath, about the AEC and going there and actually looking at your senior leadership, uh, I think is definitely reflective of a lot of broader Australian society and you could argue that all the problems that you're dealing with are symptomatic of Australian culture and society. Um, obviously when you get an 18 year old female deciding maybe if they are going to join a service and then trying to attract them into those specialist roles, we're already a little bit too late to the party in terms of changing people's mindsets and I wondered if you think there's anything Defence could do to intervene earlier and actually work towards a whole Australian society change rather than just working within each of the services. Can I, can I answer that one with one thing and one to be controversial? Well, why not? Yeah. Go on. <laughs> so the first one is, um, in our recruiting, it's much better if we get to the schools. That's where we can really enliven young people, and women particularly. And we haven't done that. There was a bit of a, um, a peace broke out, and you couldn't engage schools because that, that's bad. Defence engaging kiddies isn't, isn't a good thing. I, I completely disagree with that. I think it's a great way to energise people, give people an understanding of a vision for the future. So. Uh, I think that's definitely one way to get early and say that this is what capable women can be. You should be like this. How about you study at school and you continue and this is what will happen. My controversial piece would be, comes back to the figures. Less than 20 years of age, 1.6 men to women. My age, 8 to 1. I ask in the room here for the women how many people are so glad about flexible working arrangements? Okay. I would say to you, watch it. Why do I say that? It's because I'm sitting here because my wife and I sat down and we had a conversation on who's on first, who, who takes the lead. Because in this role, Kat's role, Michael's role, both can't, not if you have children. Someone has to look after the family piece. Who is that? Who makes that difficult decision? And I know my wife is far more intelligent, far more capable than I am. And I'm very honest with that. So we sat down, we had a, we had a long conversation. What flexible work arrangements does is it avoids that conversation. And it is a difficult one. It's much easier to have that conversation with your employee than your spouse. Be careful of flexible working arrangements. Ladies, it avoids that conversation and it gets you to where there are eight times more men than women in the position I am in, in at the moment. Can I be equally controversial? <laughs> <laughs> and we all have a different story. Uh, I'm married, my husband works full time and I have three children. My house is a bit of a mess. <laughs> uh, I don't catch up with my friends as often uh, as I would like to, but I've got three fantastic children and I'm happily married and I do do the best job I possibly can every day. So I 
think it's just a balance, and everyone does things differently. Yeah, I, I, I would partially agree with that. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. But I, I, you know, because if you're going to commit to it, you you are committing. You know, you've got a very supportive husband, and I've met him. He, he's superb. He could have done a lot better, and I could have done a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> but, and Kath, but that's not always the case. Let's face it; that's not always the case. So, just be wary of flexible. I'm, I'm your biggest advocate, ladies. Um, be wary of that flexible piece. Don't go silently into the night because someone looks like they're giving you a gift. Yeah, there is a hook to it. And that hook will keep it at eight to one. Mm. Okay, we've got time for two more questions. Mm. Sorry, oh, well now we've, you, now you've generated the. We've got time. <laughs> we've got time for four, five, six more questions. All right, well th that's okay. We we can do that. So, um, Ronnie, I just want to and then up the back then. Add to that one. Not so much a question, but um, having had that conversation in my family as well, and uh, we took a family hundred hundred thousand dollar pay cut for that decision. Um, and I have a very supportive husband. But even though we had that conversation, and I think that is different for every family circumstance, I still think there are things that we can do that will assist. My husband's a civilian, not military. Um, we don't factor civilian spousal employment and schooling options and things like that enough to enable... It's not necessarily the flexible employment. It's the flexible support options sometimes that make life harder for our decisions as a family. Mm. Yes. Okay, the lady up the back, sorry, I don't know. It's all right. Um, I'm Tony, I work for the Defence. Um, I'm wondering where your junior ranks are tonight. Where are your female junior ranks who could advocate for you and with you in increasing... I'm very thankful to be able to say, Tony, that most of mine are at sea <laughs> doing, doing what I would want this lot to be doing as well. And, and, I, and I mean this lot in the, in the best possible way. Um, and, I, and I think the junior ranks is you know, the reality of we're in Canberra, let's face it. And I'm very, very happy that there, there are no junior ranks here in Canberra with me tonight because there's no ships in Canberra either. Well, we have some in the audience. some from Army too, up the back. Mm. Okay, this lady and then... Thank you very much for speaking to us tonight. You were talking about the difficulties you're having in increasing the numbers of women in certain specialist areas, uh, and I'm guessing some of those were highly scientific and technical. Do you think that this is exacerbated by the issues we're having retaining women in the STEM pipeline? And if yes, do you see the Defence Force playing a role in helping that issue? Absolutely. I've got two daughters. And last night, at 7 o'clock, after I got home, I was sitting down with my 10-year-old helping her with her maths because, quite frankly, she's not very good at it. <laughs> um, and that we, was... We won't tell her you said that. No, <laughs> you don't have to because my wife had been telling her <laughs> that you need to lift your game, Olivia. This is not good enough. And, and you've really hit on a, on a really important point there because STEM, you know, it's, it's, it's the thing that we've all of a sudden woken up to is important. Um, who here did science... Maths, English, and all those things at school. Okay, what are, you, are your kids doing that? Mm -hmm. All of them, mm -hmm. on a percentage base? Um, probably not. A small number are, because we actually understand that it's important. For <laughs> Navy, for Navy, it's it's absolutely vital. Uh, as we go from the age of steam to the age of I won't say nuclear, um, <laughs> uh, to the age of of, of highly technical platforms. Um, being able to shovel coal is simply not good enough anymore. You've actually got to be able to drive these ships with a technical understanding. Even more so, though, we have to shape an industry that's going to build these ships in Australia for the next 100 years. And we simply do not have the technical expertise in this country to build the Navy that the government has committed us to. So we are looking uh, at all of those ways, reaching into universities, into schools, um, from a, a very much a, uh, an integrated approach to not just joining the Navy, but be, being part of an industry that will build and support Navy and saying at all levels that STEM is absolutely 
important. So we run a, a women in engineering program within Navy, uh, and uh, Warren had the uh, 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 pleasure to be escorted in Townsville the other day by one of our leading seamen marine technicians, who was one of the smartest people I think I've ever come across. Uh, truly impressive young lady, and she will um, go from being one of those junior rates who's not here today to being an officer in our Navy in the next couple of years, and I think she's probably potentially going to be sitting here in a couple of years. And what she's doing currently in her own time is bridging that STEM gap, because we're absolutely saying, if you haven't done it before, you've got to do it now, because that's where the future is. Can I, can I say this is an issue for Army as well? Army, uh, over many years, has spoken about equipping the person uh, rather than uh, manning the equipment, equipping the man rather than manning the equipment. That's changing. Uh, you know, the technology that's being introduced into Army now is also at the, mm. in some instances, the bleeding edge of the leading edge. Uh, it's an area that perhaps we've been caught a little bit flat-footed. Uh, our current chief is a scientist, so he's got a uh, particular interest in it. We don't have a STEM policy. It's something that we need to get onto, and it's something that I think we're going to play catch up on with the other two services. But I think on the back of that, it's also uh, us pushing on the manufacturers, not to make the operating interface that you have to be a scientist to operate. So we have that on some of our platforms. So the you know, the question, have you really looked into your capabilities? And there are some that we operate and go, really? Mm. Why on earth is that so complex? I just want to make that go there. Um, but we're working with companies to say, sharpen up your act. This is, this is just too technocrat. Mm. And Air Force is really bad at that. We, we love technology, OK? And we'll lean in it to it like a comfort blanket uh, for no real outcome apart from interest. But that drives. <laughs> oh, it's true. It That's really true. is. Um, so for us, that we have to unpick that a little bit to make sure that anyone can operate it, and that's the way it should be. Okay, I committed to this question. It might be our last. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rahana. I'm a graduate at Defence, and you've all spoken about the efforts to retain women in your various services. But I was wondering about the other side of that coin, which is the efforts to say to men that it's okay to be the primary caregiver and take time off from their careers. So I was just wondering if you could talk about any initiatives that the services have to, to get men to take time off and look after the house, the kids, yeah, it, it applies to, there's no gender uh, segregation or flexible work around, not a problem at all. Um, we, I would take it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that would go for all three services. Yeah. Uh, at the the women's conference we had last year, I think it was. I made the statement that I did about have that conversation. You know, if you want a career, you need to have that conversation. And to my, I was really one of the moments in life you you do you do get excited about. A young corporal came up and said, he said, I support my wife. We had that conversation, and I look after her. I thought that's impressive. Yeah, really impressive. Yeah, uh, so I think in Army, more men avail themselves of part-time work than women. Uh, absolutely no distinction. It's just part of business as usual nowadays. So, yeah, that's good to hear. Okay, with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, we, we draw the uh, formal part of the evening um, to a close. I think, Jacinta, you wanted to say a few words? And then... Yeah. I get the, um, the great pleasure of thanking you all for a very interesting evening. Uh, good evening, Jacinta Carroll. I head our Counterterrorism Policy Centre here and uh, have the joy of working on the Women in Defence and Security Network. For those of you, I'll just do a couple of things. First, I do have to advertise our network because I see a lot of new faces here this evening. And then I'll go on to the, the great pleasure of thanking our very informative and very open and, and entertaining, I have to say, panel for this evening. <laughs> This evening's talk has really exemplified why we have the Women in Defence and Security Network. The topic is women. Our last question in particular just showed how this is actually about people. Every Women in Defence and Security Network event we've had has done something very special, and that is to rather than talk about uh, hard elements and the non-human factor or big theoretical issues as we typically at ASPE discuss in this room, 
we dive into very, very personal, very intimate issues. And I would like to thank all our panellists for opening up their own views and very much opening up their, their personal lives and their personal struggles, intimate stories about their families and their own career paths. But of course, as professionals and leaders of our services, they've translated that firmly into leadership at a personal level and corporate direction on a strategy that I know, I've, I'm sitting here wishing I was 18 again because I would mm -hmm. do something different from uh, well, the, great, the great pleasure I did have um, working in defence for a long time and, 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 and being a reservist. But I think there are opportunities now that have moved us far beyond the storming uh, that Major General Tui described at the beginning into very much a, a, a hunger, a striving for performing. We're in the norming stage. We're, we're not, there's no denial here that there are any, any issues. But the great thing that we've seen here is that we're able to transcend not just that personal to a corporate outcome, but bring it back to core capability, which is people. Uh, we, we always go into anecdotes in WDSM because it is about uh, people, and, and I'll, if you indulge me for a moment, uh, I was thinking of a lot of memories of my first experiences as well, but, but one that happened mid-career, I was at, at CDSS at the Defence College, and it, it only just occurred to me now that we had no female military on that course at all. Uh, we had a number of chiefs of service and so on. There were three female um, defence public servants and uh, we, we had the great joy and privilege of going on a few trips together and I remember at one of them fair, a fair way during the year and I had two of my colleagues, military officers, come up and they said to me, oh, Jacinta, look, we're just sick of every time we go out somewhere, the guys want to go out to a bar can you just tell them that we'd actually like to go out to a restaurant and perhaps a wine bar, but all this noise is just, you know, just does my head in. I, I didn't mind going to a pub myself, but it, look, it, it, it's just a minor example and uh, I think most people in the room would understand that what I was able to do in, say, in coming forward as a woman to say, look, can we just go somewhere else, was enable all of us to be human and enable some of my military colleagues, my male military colleagues, to not be a stereotype themselves. And that's some of the cultural change that some of you have talked about. Look, it's been a wonderful, wonderful exploration this evening. It's, it's a wonderful advertisement for the extraordinary things that you're doing in your services. Thank you so much for joining us. We've never had such a quick turnaround response for any WDSN event. Uh, every Deputy Chief wanted to be here. Deputy Chief of Army uh, was very apologetic and I think a little bit upset when he couldn't be here at the last moment. And we thank, we thank um, General Tui We've for coming along. We've got to take her. Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> and, um, and of course to the Senior Service and the Air Force for stepping up and having our Deputy Chiefs here. And a particular vote of thanks to Margaret, uh, our wonderful, wonderful supporter on the ASPE board. Thank you so much for being here and, and running a, a beautiful evening. Please do continue to come to our events. As you will see, we, we touch a range of issues. Uh, we, we are very uh, uh, privileged to host many inspirational leaders, but also we sometimes just decide we're going to do some networking. So there's a, there's a, a variety of things that happen here, and if you've got ideas that you'd like to see, we'll do our best to, have to do those as well. So thank you very much. Particular thanks to our sponsors, Lockheed Martin, without whom we could not do this. And, uh, and also thanks to them, we have some fabulous drinks and canapes outside. And I, and I ask you to continue these great conversations and these challenging questions. So please join me in thanking our panel.